When a big idea needs money, startups go to Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley. I'm Scott McGrew. Join me for a new podcast featuring conversations with Silicon Valley's power players. Subscribe now to Sand Hill Road, the podcast. This week, the founder of Bloom Energy on the company's 10-year path from a gushing debut on 60 Minutes through an IPO and what it's accomplishing today. A frank talk with Dr. K.R. Sridhar. And would you live in an adult dorm? Star City's John Dishotsky thinks you will for the right price. Our reporters, Rachel Becker from Cal Matters and Bloomberg's David Baker. This week on Press Here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Scott McGrew. Normally, I make a short introduction about the interview we're about to do, give you a little background. I introduce the guest. The questions begin. I'm going to ask K.R. Schreeder for his patience this morning. I think this one needs a little bit more background than normal. K.R. makes something called the Bloom Energy Server. It's a box that takes natural gas or biogas and turns it into electricity. It's a fuel cell, if you're familiar with that term. No combustion, no noise just electricity. Its byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. Lots of very big organizations are using Bloom devices. The SAP Center in San Jose, Kaiser Permanente Hospitals, Walmart, Google, Safeway, even NASA. Now making power on site is not just more efficient and cleaner. Here in California, it may be downright necessary. PG&E has warned it may cut off electricity to Californians during times of high fire danger, and all of a sudden, alternative on-site power is a hot commodity, Bloom Energy included. KR sees a business opportunity here as CEO. He's here to talk about that. As CEO, he also knows I'm gonna wanna talk about, among other things, the rough time the company's had on the stock market and Bloom's unusual backstory. But we'll start with this idea of the microgrid. Dr. Schreeder is a former NASA scientist where he worked on, among other things, thinking how to turn Mars's atmosphere into oxygen. He's got degrees in mechanical and nuclear engineering. He's joined this morning by Rachel Becker of CalMatters and David Baker of Bloomberg. Thanks for being with us this morning. All of the sudden, you have a, an, an alternative to this worry that PG&E is giving us about turning off the power. Over at Google, over at Walmart, you are running electrical plants in the parking lot. That is correct, Scott. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. Electricity is about six things. It's about safety, it's about reliability, it's about resiliency, it's about sustainability, it's about access, it's about affordability. You need to provide that in a combined package because in the modern digital world, electricity is a human need. It is not a maybe I, I can have it. And you've proven yourself on this. I saw that during the New York power outage recently, your boxes stayed on and provided power. During the Northridge, uh, California, uh, uh, what is about 7.5? 7.1. 7.1. 7 .1. Yeah, yeah. Stressed. Your boxes stayed on. I mean, those are going to be dependable things for people that need that kind of electricity. And there were two super typhoons in the city of Osaka, and we were powering the fish market, and it was the only power that was available in all of Osaka during those two super typhoons. So our boxes are resilient. The key thing is this. Uh, centralized anything that is very large has an Achilles heel. Uh, somewhere something happens, and it disrupts large amounts of people. Distributed inherently causes less damage should there be some instance. It's much more localized. We are a distributed generation. On top of that, our devices are built tough. They're built robust, and they've proven themselves. That combination says that the future of electricity, because we live in a post-climate change world where there'll be more natural disasters, that are stronger, longer in duration, and more frequent, we need reliable electricity that is resilient. So it's adaptability to climate change is what we try to do. So what happens if we have an event like a major earthquake that knocks out natural gas lines in addition to electricity? Because that does sometimes happen. It does sometimes happen, but here's the, here's the record for it. After the uh, huge Japan earthquake and tsunami, 
the only infrastructure that was still operating in Fukushima was the natural gas. After the 7.1 earthquake, not only did we operate that one unit in Ridgecrest, which was in the epicenter, in a 100 mile radius, we had 25 locations. Not one location lost gas supply. I was disappointed to discover that my solar will not work <laughs> if the power goes out. So your Bloom boxes or Bloom energy servers will, will work if the power goes out. They are generating their own electricity for themselves. That is correct. We are always on 24 seven. So even if you have a backup generator, just think about this. Let's not even go into all the bad emissions that come from diesel generators and they're not designed for days of operation. It's only for minutes and hours. We'll get to that in a minute. But when the power goes up, there needs to be a sensor that tells the backup generator, you need to start now. Right. That's like starting your car that has not been started sitting in the garage for a long period of time. And it better start and then switches need to fall from one side to the other, and if anything goes wrong, things don't work. So very often, the statistics are 40% of the time, something happens wrong in that transition happening and electric you know, you know, power doesn't come. With the bloom box, we are constantly producing power where we are, so when the grid goes out, our boxes don't know that the grid has gone out. So the customer never sees even a blip in their electricity, which is extremely important for continuous manufacturing and data centers and things like that. How does that math work, though? Because then you have continuous production of green, a greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, for those occasional times when you're going to need a backup generator. So if you, if you look at a very large facility, you, you take a you know, uh, superstore or you take a hospital, the amount of power that they get today, anywhere in any city, has at least 60%, 50%, even when we go to our RPS goals, coming from base load power, that base load power is from a fossil fuel source, and the cleanest of fossil fuel sources is natural gas. That natural gas in a large fossil fuel source is coming through transmission distribution and losing efficiency, which means its carbon footprint is greater than the carbon footprint that we put out on a regular basis. Okay, I, th I think I've got these numbers in front of me. This is pounds per megawatt hour, the grid in California about 1083, 1083, and you say yours about 735 to 849. Yes, so we are lower in carbon footprint than the marginal grid, right. even in a state like California, which is very clean, in other states and other countries, it's much more superior. Let me let me follow up with the kind of the what I started with in the beginning is you've got you know the Tesla Powerwall batteries, you've got some solar companies though apparently not yeah. mine, uh, in which they will work when the when the power goes out and and the fires are raging, etc. Uh, this could be for you a, a bit of a business opportunity. You've tried to sell this as local. You've, you've sold it as cleaner, if not clean. Right. But now you've all of a sudden, here's a, here's a third way that your salespeople can get out in front, of, uh, in front of companies. Yes, it's resilient, reliable microgrid. And what we will do is we will have a bloom box along with solar panels if they exist in the building, along with battery storage if it exists, combined together as a microgrid. And that microgrid will take the best assets depending on what you have when, when the sun is shining, whatever solar is available, we will obviously use it. Right. But you need power when the sun is not shining. Bloom needs to operate. Dr. K.R. Sridhar is with Bloom Energy, the founder and CEO. If you're just joining us, and we'll take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Press here. If you're just joining us, we're talking with the CEO and founder of Bloom Energy. We just finished talking about how Bloom Energy servers can be used to provide electricity in times of crises, especially as PG&E cuts off power during episodes of high fire danger. Now I want to talk about Bloom itself because Bloom Energy is not just any company. Its birth was the closest Silicon Valley ever got to something biblical. It started with a very positive report from Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes in 2010. K.R. Schreeder invited us to be the first news organization to take a look at the innards of the Bloom box that he'd been toiling on for nearly a decade. So this is it? K.R. offered to give me a sneak peek inside the Bloom box. 
Nobody has seen this before. Are you going to let me look inside? Absolutely. Okay. Why right. not? Then just days later in February 2010, the grand unveiling, the Steve Jobs-like reveal. The governor was there. It was that big. Colin Powell was there, as well as legendary venture capitalist and Bloom Energy investor John Doerr, who said something that has stuck with me all these years. I was talking with uh, my friend Larry Page about the nature of this event, and it, it strikes the two of us, this is like the Google IPO. But he was wrong. While Bloom did IPO, it would be a decade later nearly, and its share price, which started at 15, hit a high of about 35, trades this morning for about $4.10. The headlines in 2019 are very different than the headlines we read in 2010. K.R. Sridhar is well aware of those headlines. As the CEO, he knows the buck stops with him. I, we'll get to the stock price in a minute, but that was, must have been magical for you to have 60 minutes. I realize you prearranged a lot of that, but you just exploded into Silicon Valley in 2010. Eight years in stealth, and here's this gigantic star-studded uh, mm -hmm. debut. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 10 years later, is this where you thought you'd be? So what has happened in 10 years is a key question to ask, which is what you're asking. Let me put some numbers for you. Since 1981, 1979 is when Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House roof. 1981 is when commercial production started. To, through 2011, 30 years, whatever amount of so energy solar power had produced as an industry, Bloom produced in the last nine years. Alone words, as a single company. Take, take Alone time. as a single company. Yes. Okay, that's a, that's a statistic. Yeah. I, I mean, those are real numbers from DOE that can be verified. Right. Right? So we have moved at rapid pace for a brand new technology that did not exist before that nobody else did. Let me, let me give you a comparison. Company. In that debut at eBay, it took place yeah. at eBay, and the parking lot was not a single Tesla. Yes. Nor a single electric car, for that matter. Right. Yeah. True. Well, look, when you talk about different vehicles or different technologies and what you need to do, while Tesla was an electric car, the electric infrastructure, the rules of the road, how to put them in the street, they existed. For us, we were not just building a company, we were not just building an industry, we we're building an ecosystem. When we go to a city to put this, every city has a different permitting rule. Uh, some places, the fire marshal says, you're putting gas and you're doing something in a box and you're producing electricity, it can get hot, wait, I need to open and see everything. Let me open this up to, to, to David. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a very different thing. And that's one, one, one data point. Right. The second data point is, you showed the segment. In that segment, they said, now that they've shown this, within 10 years, there'll be lots of these. None of them will carry the Bloom name. It'll say names of large companies. There is not a single company, even today, that can do what we do. And yet, when you look back over the last 10 years, you know, if we think about other technologies that were emerging and really getting going at that time, you talked about solar, mm -hmm. you know, we did get to a hockey stick kind of adoption curve with solar, especially in California, where it finally at one point did take off right. and the prices got to be right. A lot of us who cover this space have sort of been waiting for that to happen to fuel cells to right. see if it would. And they've never gone away. They've sort of eked out slow, steady growth, but we've right. never actually seen them really take off the way you would expect with a technology that's got all the advantages that you're advertising. What has held this industry back? Well, multiple things. Uh, I would say it's not held the industry back because, again, you're taking it from, you're taking a snapshot from 2010 to 2020. You're absolutely right. If you draw the curve from 1981, which is when the solar panels were invented and you look at it, it was absolutely flat for a very long period of time where a lot of things were happening and it took off. If, if we ask what was the tipping point for solar, it was like you said, California mandated a million rooftops. California mandated a NEM law and said, utilities, munis, anybody shall be asked to 
implement this with the standard Solar policy. got help from government. Help, and help. you've been getting help from government as well, right? I mean, right. there are rebates, there are tax breaks that these companies are getting as well. Right. How much of your business depends on California or the federal government coming in and helping with the money? Sure. So here's the thing. Uh, the first few years in California, we depended on something called a self-generation incentive program. That was an incentive from the state of California. We depend zero on that. There is no, you know, there is no incentive today. All the alternative energy technologies depend on something called investment tax credit. That's a federal tax credit. Right. We also enjoy that like everybody else. But that is almost not even leveling the playing field because here's the thing. If you look at a PG&E or any utility, um, they will sell to a large commercial industrial complex for 12 to 13 cents on average electricity. They will sell to homes at 56 cents to 60 cents a kilowatt hour electricity. That's what you and I pay. But I am not allowed to sell to the home, multiple homes, uh, and I'm only allowed right. to send with, so they are subsidized in a different way and it is not even leveling the playing field when ITC comes in. Do you think there's a, a point in which natural gas lost its luster as far as green energy goes? I mean, it's not green green, but it is the cleanest of them. And there has been a pushback from some governments about, well, yeah, solar's fine, uh, hydro's fine, that sort of thing. Uh, but natural gas is still, you know, a carbon fuel. Santa Clara recently uh, banned you guys, right? Because yes, and we are fighting that. You're and suing so, them, correct? So, so yes, we are. And, and here's why. Let me explain this. Great question. Let me explain this in a very simple way. Today, there is no pathway for just renewable energy with storage to be able to take care of our modern life. Right. I agree there with that is 100%. Just absolutely. There's no expert in the world that will say that. Hey, Arlen, now, let me, let me hold on, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do because, you know, I'm the boss and I get to do these sorts of things, is I'm going to turn to that camera, tell the people on television what's coming up next, and then we'll just come right back to this to conversation. We'll do that online at PressHereTV.com. Sure. So hold that thought. If you're watching on television, we're going to get to something else. If you would like to continue this conversation, I will be fair with Dr. Schreeder and do that on PressHereTV.com. So, on TV, up next, a solution to San Francisco's high housing prices when Press Here continues. Welcome back. You are now joining us online at PressHereTV.com, which a lot of the world watches, in fact, all over the world uh, watches this program. Continue your thought. I had to interrupt you so that I could pay bills and pay for this studio. No problem. So, look, here's what you have. Climate change is about global greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. Right. It's not about renewable fuels and fossil fuels. It is about reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the air as quickly as you can because it's a race against time. The CO2 going in into the atmosphere stays there for an extended period of time. Now, if you look at the entire world, look at the amount of wood, biomass, coal that is being burnt and just replacing them with natural gas, what it'll do to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in a short period of time and compare that with the most optimistic renewable penetration and what that can do. I think you're you answering that my you question need that, both. that natural you gas need is both. getting an unfair shake in there. Yes, it is. Yeah. it is. You will need all of the above because right. we have one planet to live in and we have to adapt every possible technology there is to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is a very short-sighted approach to saying the transition fuel or better is the enemy of good. Right. Although you're also trying to position the company for the, the next stage after that since you can do hydrogen now. Absolutely. Right? So, so then the thing is while you're doing that, while you're shifting from other dirtier forms of fuel to the cleanest of fossil fuels and, and also using that to generate in the cleanest possible way electricity. And it's not just about CO2. It's about the health risk causing emissions that you get, SOx, NOx, particulates. Right. We don't put any of that out. We don't use water. 
So there's a lot of environmental stuff you got to think about. And on top of that, what you have is the pipe that comes in with natural gas, the molecules can be greened. The pipe is a great asset. Don't hate the pipe. <laughs> if you don't like the molecules, green the molecules. There's hydrogen, there is biogas, and there is even a technology very soon that'll come where you can take the natural gas, but you can capture the carbon and trap it and not let it go into the atmosphere. All of the above is what we need to fight climate change. Your um, VP of policy, Josh Richmond, mm -hmm. he said that biogas was still, you know, not as available and that it's three to five times more expensive than natural gas. And yet you have these municipalities, you've got Berkeley phasing out nat natural gas and new construction, you've got San Mateo, yeah. you've got Santa Clara saying that they want, they'll only allow fuel cells if they run off of biogas. So you're in this limbo moment as kind of the state starts seeing the problem with continuing natural gas and emitting CO2 from natural gas. and biogas still not being viable yet, how are you going to survive in that interval? Well, look, reality is going to meet policy very soon when we have multiple days of power outage. The city of Lathrop, 20,000 people plus in the most polluted air in the country, in Central Valley, says for the 20,000 people, every single day of not having PG&E power, they will burn 10,000 gallons of gasoline. If that is the price to pay for people not to use natural gas that's cleaner, people are not going to accept it. It is about dealing with the causes of climate change, which is everything we need to do with more renewables, cleaner fuels, but also dealing with the consequences of climate change because without electric power, Hospitals are not going to run. You're not be going to be able to pump gas. Water is not going to flow in the f faucet. You're not going to be able to flush your toilet. What's the price comparison, though, between solar and storage and a bloom box? So if you had, let us take a hospital. On the top of the hospital, you put solar and storage. It will barely power the lights in your hallway when the sun shines. That's all you can do. There is a land and amount of power that you can get from solar issue. You can't power these kind of landscapes that we have in the background with just solar and wind because it's a land use issue. It's an intermittency issue. Energy is the ultimate perishable. There is no technology today to be able to take care of five days of power outage with solar and wind not for decades to come. Let me get back to the finances for a minute. Um, Crunchbase has you as taking 825 million in venture capital funding. Wikipedia, a billion. Uh, is it closer to a billion? We could uh, settle the Wikipedia issue, couldn't we? It is, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, is, it, is, it is greater than a billion and it is announced in our S1, so okay. it, is, it is public record. Fair enough, uh, I, hate, I hate going through S1. <laughs> um, is there pressure from the investors to, to get something done. We've talked a bit about the stock price being about a third of what it was when you IPO'd. Is there, you know, is there, we've invested more than a billion dollars and we need to start seeing some kind of return because you're not making a profit. We, we are on a net operating basis outside of stock-based compensation. Right, you're not making a and, 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 and in terms of cash flow, we are not a user of cash. Okay, like but generating cash. return, where's but my return? So, I gave you a billion dollars. So, so, so look, our, our investors who have been with us for a very long period Including of time. Including John Doerr. Invested in the IPO after waiting for 18 years. Yeah. Because what we are building, we are focused on building a company where here's what I can tell you, we are in our fifth generation product. There is no competition to what we do in the field that we do, which is offering the six elements of electricity all together. Would it be fair to get, draw right. the analogy to Jeff Bezos if Jeff Bezos was here in the 90s and I said, Jeff, you know, we've invested so much in Amazon, where's our return? Would they, is that the sort of thing that you're saying? Many people who look at both our industries would say, I don't know what Jeff would say, but many people, including Jim Collins, the, you know, the author of Good to Great, will say we are, bo we are both building companies that are flywheels. The flywheels take a lot to crank up. Once it's cranked up, it'll get to where it needs to go. So we're focused on the long term. Look at what's happening. Cost of electricity is going up from the grid. 
the reliability and the resiliency of the grid is going down in a post-climate change world. Our products are getting more reliable, more resilient, cleaner, and cheaper. Let me stick in one last question with K.R. Sridhar, and that is I have your, your board here. Uh, your board is made up of a banker, a tech CEO, the venture capitalist John Doerr, uh, former military, Colin Powell, nice get. Uh, Scott Sandel uh, is a banker with expertise in, in energy. Yourself, a banker and a banker. Which means the only scientist, the only energy expert, really is you, right? On your whole board. Right. Should your board be more diversified with people who know more about what's going on in this industry? There's a lot of bankers. Uh, there's also uh, John Chambers, who's a tech CEO. Yeah, the board, yes, right? I mentioned him, yeah. Right. Uh, so we are, a, we are a technology company disrupting how power is done. But the validation of how does the power industry see us and do they like us, here's what I can answer to you. The top three utility companies in the country, Exelon, Southern, and Duke, have all invested in Bloom for deployments, that total is greater than a billion and a half outside the equity to purchase our systems. So that's validation from the energy industry that what we are doing is relevant to the future because the value is behind the meter, not in front of the meter. KR, let me wrap this up with this simple question. Let's rejoin each other in five years. Yes. And I'm going to play back whatever it is that you are about to say. My challenge is in five years, what should I have expected from you? In five years, what you will see is microgrids will be something that we don't have to explain to your viewers what they mean because they'll be ubiquitous because the post-climate change world is going to need it. They're going to understand we need to fight both the causes and the consequences of climate change and not just one because one is about is the world going to end? The next one is, is it going to end next month for me? And that should not be a choice. We should not let either one of those questions be answered in the affirmative. And Bloom is working on doing both as opposed to just one. Dr. K. Sridhar, founder of Bloom, thanks for being with us. Thank you.